This is a bit of a different setting, isn't it? Well, uh, I'm so excited uh, that we can be out here uh, to rejoice in uh, the truth of God's word out in his creation and, and to hear about his creation from Helmet, um, enjoying uh, the outdoors, enjoying uh, being outside with one another. Um, so let's, uh, let's stand together and uh, we'll pray and then uh, okay. we can sing together. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you. Um, we thank you for your grace. We rejoice in the truth of our salvation. Lord, we, um, we want to glorify your name. Lord, we worship you for everything that you are. Lord, all of, um, that, you've, all of that you've given us that we don't deserve. Everything from your grace to our next breath. Lord, we... We're unworthy, but you still extended your grace to us. You still called us to be sons and daughters. Lord, for that, we will glorify your name. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.
We're glad every, each and every one of you are here this morning. And uh, as you come in, if you haven't, we're trying to get all the uh, programs and lyric sheets out. So if you need one, see Anita here walking around. We're She's trying to help you out. Good. Well, I just uh, want to welcome you. And if you do have a program and you do have a pen, if you would be willing to um, uh, open that up. And on the right-hand side, you see that tear-off section. If you'd like to put your name on there, we've got the offering box over here to my right by the table. And you can drop those in if you have uh, prayer requests. Put those in on there as well, and we will continue to pray for those things. Well, I want to thank our staff and others for this weekend, especially I think we need to give Carrie Barfels a round of applause. She's worked awful hard this weekend, and we have an annual report up there that she's put together for the business meeting and lots of things. And But, you know, with the movie on Friday night and the return yesterday and outdoor today, we're just uh, thankful. But our staff's worked hard, and we appreciate each and every one of them. And also those who helped as well to make this possible. Well, men's breakfast, all men are invited to enjoy breakfast here coming up on October 10th. That's a little ways away, but we just want to get you thinking about that. It's a great time of food and fellowship, and I don't know, one, one month was Chick-fil-A, the next month was McDonald's, and we'll wait to see what we're going to do this month, right, Mario? Okay, and then Fire and Fellowship coming up in October on the 16th on a Friday night, and we'll just gather around here at 630, we'll have some hot dogs and s'mores and chips, and just enjoy a time of being together in the outdoors. And... Um, also, we have some Bible studies. Ann's been talking about a couple, but here's one that I'm going to lead, and it's hopefully through people on Zoom as well as uh, our church folks, and that's Disciples Making Disciples. It's been on my heart for a long time that we can talk about it, but we need to have an avenue to do this. And so uh, I've got a book from the Timothy Initiative, and it's just a real quick one-hour Bible study every Tuesday. We haven't set the time yet because I want to see who's involved and we can we're going to do it by zoom so if you're interested if you want more information please see me i'm expecting not a very big group but a committed group a group that wants to be accountable to not only do the material but also to have spiritual conversation throughout the week maybe an opportunity to share the gospel as we go through those eight weeks so it begins on uh, october the the 6th and i just encourage you if you're interested let me know we've already got two people interested and uh, also we have a couple other ones the highest said Jewish foundation of our stu faith study that starts Wednesday, September 30th. That's this week. Wednesdays from 1 to 3:15. See Ann Gray if you're interested in that. And then the Torah Club. Everything's on the left side of your uh, program of these things here. Uh, the Torah Club. The Jesus, my Jewish rabbi, covering the events of Jesus' life in chronological order from the first century Jewish perspective. Ann Gray is your leader for that as well. So. Lots of startup things, and we hope that you'll just consider uh, getting into God's Word if you're not already involved in a Bible study. Don't forget, you can always download the church app. I have numerous people tell me it's been valuable for them to know what time events are and what's going on, and so uh, we encourage you to, to do that. And we're hoping, Lord willing, and the weather permitting, to do this outside for at least next week and maybe the week after. So. The elders met, and they've decided if it's 50 degrees or warmer and no rain, we're going to meet outside. So we'll be doing this hopefully in at least the next two weeks. And just turn your attention to, to a time to reflect and be thankful for the offerings and the gifts that have come in this week and continue to come in. And again, if you came prepared to give, you can see the offering box over there by the table. And uh, also they're in the lobby as well. And uh, as we think of the offering today, um, I just want to also remember to pray for Ian Fink. His sister passed away this week, and uh, we need to continue to pray for, for Ian and his family, and also Mel Dirksen, who's um, still alive, but he's, he's just concerned and thinks he's ready to go home to be with the Lord, and so we need to keep praying for him. So let's pray and dedicate this offering to the Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us out here. We thank you for the beauty of your nature. We can just sit out here and enjoy praising you through song and through the word. And Lord, I just ask that you would uh, just be with Mel Dirksen today. Lord, as I've talked to him this week, he's ready to go home and to be with you. He's had 97 great years here on earth. But Lord, if you want to spare him, if you want to bring healing to him, Lord, that would be our prayer as well. We want your will to be done. 
and it just bring comfort and care to him and be with Dan and Don and the family and Steve as they take care of his needs. And for Ian, Lord, it's difficult with his sister passing away in Maryland and unable to attend the funeral because of COVID. And just pray that he'll be able to continue to build a relationship with his brother-in-law and that side of his family. And Lord, to be a witness for Christ to them. And Lord, we just dedicate the money that's come in. Lord, we know that we're actually giving to you. It's an offering. It's a sweet savor to you. And Lord, we know that these monies are used to take care of the lights and support our missionaries and ministries. But Lord, truly, we give to you because it's through these things that we can honor and glorify you and reach people for Jesus Christ. So we pray your blessing on this offering this week, and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together again.
sin or to shame. We are divided in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord.
playing great music, you may be seated. It's time for our message. And you know that we have been going through the book of Genesis for a good period of time. And uh, it's so important that we really understand this uh, particular book. And we've emphasized this weekend Genesis by having the Friday night movie is Genesis History. And uh, today we're going to have Helmut Welk come and he's going to share in this hour and then uh, connect groups if you're in junior and senior high and then adults, all three of other connect groups. We're going to meet in the sanctuary and Helmut's going to share with us a little bit about um, the perspective of Adam and Eve being our, our ancestors and everything comes from them. But I want to just focus on this because there's really two kinds of Christian people. There's those that God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. And then there's another group of Christians where Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic priest, he came out and talked about how there's some that want evidence. <clears throat> they want to not only know that God said it, but they want some evidence outside of the Bible to give them uh, some substantiation for the faith that they have, a reasonable faith. It's like Josh McDowell said in his book, don't leave your brains at the door. Some of us want more background information. So that's why Helmut's here today. Helmut is, has a master's degree from the University of Illinois. He is an engineer. He just retired a couple years ago from John Deere after a long career there. But most importantly, he's president of the Quad City Creation Science Association and travels the, all around the world to Germany as well as in our country to share these things. And so let's give a warm welcome to Helmut Well. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's delightful to be out here. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, pretty much everybody. <clears throat> well, human genetics and the Bible. How many of you put those two topics together? You know, okay, a few of you. But most of the time, most of us don't think of the science of genetics, which is a fairly modern science and a lot of research going on in that area. And then we have the Bible. What does the Bible have to say? Does it even know anything about genetics? Well, what I want to do is try to connect those two topics for you today. Um, and it does have to do with evolutionary theory. Uh, most of you are familiar with that and, and Darwin's teaching. But what I'm going to do is uh, focus on genetics and that science. And I personally know several research geneticists. So I don't make this stuff up. As an engineer, I know how to do research, and I know how to apply science in the real world. So I approach this that way. And if you have come to me with a, a proposal, I'll say, well, that's very interesting, nice idea. Uh, let's dig a little deeper. Do you have any data? Do you have information to back it up? And uh, that's, that's what we want to do. God is. Uh, called us to have a sound mind. He has given us that ability to think, to do uh, research, to read, and evaluate. And that's what I really like to uh, teach, especially young people. Learn to think, think, think. And I have a picture of the thinker. How many of you remember the thinker statue, right? And those of us that are old enough, you might remember Dobie Gillis. Remember that TV show? He's how he began the show in front of the thinker. Think, think, think uh, when you're told different ideas and uh, see if they can be substantiated, learn the facts. And then when you have the facts, things that are verifiable, that's what helps you to think. If you just have a blank mind and you don't learn the facts, then you can go anywhere and you don't make a good progress. I am so happy <clears throat> that you as a church along with Pastor Ed, are studying Genesis. Genesis is, is not poetry. There are parts of the Bible that are very clearly poetry and have a poetic story and, a, and a, maybe a hypothetical story like the parables, but a true, clear message. Genesis, however, is written in a, as a narrative. And if you were here Friday night uh, or you want to pick up the DVD, is Genesis History, Dr. Del Tackett goes over that uh, very clearly and uh, covers a lot of that, including a lot of geology. 
But there's a verse in the New Testament that addresses this question, where do we come from? In 1 Corinthians 15, we have a discussion on the resurrection. And uh, there are a lot of passages there that uh, I used in, uh, in funerals, quite frankly, uh, talking about the resurrection. But it talks about a living resurrection, not just, you know, thoughts and minds and stuff like that. And it gets into the flesh. Does the flesh really rise again from the dead? And there's an interesting verse in the middle of that discussion. 1 Corinthians 15, 39 says, For not all flesh is alike, but there is one kind for men, mankind, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. That is a totally different idea than evolutionary story. You are never a fish. You are your ancestors. And yet PBS has children's programs that say, uh, entitled, Your Inner Fish. And they talk about how fish decided one day, a couple of them maybe, to climb up on the land. I think you needed at least two, right? And the fins turned into legs, and the legs became stronger, and the backbone became stronger, and the gills were replaced by lungs, and so on. Life came onto land, eventually turned into T-Rexes, which is an amazing story in of itself. But then some of that became you. So here, even in the New Testament says, there's another flesh. It's totally different between you, mankind, and fish along with the beasts, animals, and the birds. So let's go back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, say it, God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. In Hebrew, there is no one word for universe. You heard that Friday night, you remember? So when God wants to talk about the universe in Hebrew, the Hebrews, what they use is the phrase heaven and earth. And that is the universe as we know it today. Obviously, they didn't have that concept in general, but they saw the stars. They knew everything. When it says heaven and earth, you're talking about the universe and everything in it. And then the rest of Genesis 1 basically gives us an outline on how to create a universe and everything in it in six easy steps. <laughs> right? And uh, we have a whole nother talk on that, gets into some physics and other things, but uh, what I want to emphasize is you go through the outline with the six days of creation. When it comes to living things, whether the plants, or only some of the plants were created on day three, uh, more on day six, if you think about it. But anyway, animals, fish, and since everything were mostly on days five and six. And in each of those things, when it gets to living things, it talks about reproducing after their own kind, according to its own kind. Let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, wild animals according to their kind. Now, there are uh, PhD biologists researching what is the creative kind that we have here in the beginning. And uh, if you're familiar with the genetic the biological classifications, a lot of scientists think that that kind is at the family level. So you've got the different phyla, and it goes all the way down. At the bottom, we have what we call species or subspecies, and then it's uh, genus, and then the next level is family. Like the dog family is a created kind, we think. All dogs, wolves, foxes, uh, hyenas and so on, they're all types of dog in the dog family. And even whether they're big, like a Great Dane or a Chihuahua, they're all dogs. And the genetic material was there for the diversity. And of course, in the last few hundred years, we, we emphasize different traits that we want. Small dog, big floppy ears, pointed ears. Dog for shepherding, dog for hunting. And dogs that ladies can carry in their purse. But they're all dogs. And every kind is going to be created. At the end of creation week, God says, it was very good. He's 
got the six steps done and all of creation God says is good now today we know when everything reproduces after its own kind including oak trees inside the acorns or people or fish they reproduce based on genetic information today we know the reason we reproduce after our own kind is what's in our DNA DNA is the blueprint and it's been called the language of life it is packed full of information I worked on very large computer codes and simulation codes well this is phenomenally amazing type of coding I think when God says it was very good all of creation was very good not there was no sin in the world there was no imperfections and so what happens is that we can then say the DNA is perfect a lot of diversity in it so that there could be some different hair coloring or furs types of ears but like I said dog stays dog oak trees golden oaks black oaks different types of oak trees another example but they're all oaks a created kind what ensures that is our DNA now how many of you heard terms like chromosomes and uh, genome and nucleotides let me just try to uh, lay that out for you when you think of DNA that it's referred to as our genome the genome is all of your DNA so think of it as an encyclopedia multiple books all of the DNA all of the coding that is necessary to develop you from a fertilized egg an embryo a newborn baby going through puberty a lot of things have to happen and it's all inside of that genetic code that we know today and so lots of it is used during various parts of your life and then other parts it's not needed but it's necessary otherwise you wouldn't be alive today all of it that's what geneticists are finding out there's no such thing as junk DNA if you ever heard that term so the whole genome is like an encyclopedia multiple volumes this encyclopedia the genome is divided into 23 pairs of volumes so you could say 46 but they're always paired up and so you got 23 pairs of volumes so think of them as different books on the shelf of a single encyclopedia when you hear chromosomes that's a subset of the genome a volume okay and then you can take one of those chromosomes or a volume off the shelf and inside of it you have many articles some of those articles are long and some are very short but they're all inside a single volume. so what's inside the chromosome are the genes these are various length sections of a chromosome okay so the gene is like an article inside one book of an encyclopedia those are your genes and they got a series of codes like a subset or a subroutine in a large computer program to do specific things to make proteins and also to control other genes to tell them okay now make your protein and now stop so it's very complex but that's the genes as a subset of the chromosomes and then the genes how is this all written well it's written in a language that uh, with four letters in it uh, instead of just you know like 26 or other numbers in different alphabets there's four and scientists call them a t c and g those are their, their designations <clears throat> and typically in the chromosome or in the genes you've seen the twisted ladder well one rung of the ladder is a a nucleotide or a base pair because there's always two of those letter in a rung of a ladder and then of course you know it could be very long in fact it could be stretched out your DNA it'd be almost a meter or six or three and a half feet long it's amazing it's all there but that's still remember divided into chromosomes chromosomes have genes and all of that then is written in nucleotides or base pairs so just a little background you didn't know you're gonna have a science lesson today did you again I want to emphasize that this would have been created perfect 
and built in with all the diversity we see necessary in the world today. <clears throat> now we'll come along to Genesis 3 and what happened? We have the fall. Sin enters the world. We have a disaster. Adam and Eve given free will and just a few rules, not many really. But then the enemy came along and said, did God really say that? And it's just like today. Did God really mean that in this section of scripture or something else? And so we have the sin. They chose to sin. They made that a choice. And that was this terrible event. We live in a culture today that doesn't take sin seriously, do we? Oh, that's just a little white lie. Oh, you know, rolling stop. Yeah, I know they want me to stop, but there's nobody else around. And so on and so on. You can think of it. But God takes sin seriously. And the wages of sin is death. That's where we have the introduction of disease, suffering, and dying. In fact, it's so bad. In chapter 3 of Genesis 17... God says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Sin introduces death. It was death by conscious people choosing to disobey the word of God. And this has everything. I think that's most of the law of the second law of thermodynamics was introduced where everything is decaying everything that was once perfect when God said it was good now we begin to decay and eventually die some quicker, some slower but we all can't avoid it in Romans it says for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now, yes everything in creation is groaning so um, many of us will look at this, realize Genesis is a narrative, not poetic. And we will look at this story and say, okay, at the end of creation week, we have perfection. Sometime, and I would guess one to two weeks later, Adam and Eve choose to sin. What's the result of sin? Death. That's where death, disease, dying enters the world, and it affects everything. It affects everything everything so that happens and just as the bible teaches and you consistent throughout uh, the new testament as well death comes after the sin of conscious people who choose to sin against god now the alternative story the one that you know we're all taught and i'm very well i was taught this i know the science is supposedly of uh, creation but uh, here's a good description of the alternative view, the evolutionary view. Carl Sagan, an American atheistic astronomer, he said this when it came to the question how we got here. He said, how did we as human beings get here? Only through an immense number of deaths. Death and accident, death and accident, death and accident for billions of years, you and I, our brains and all, are here today. Now, the end of that he was trying to be cute kind of like a dr zeus type rhyme right but there's nothing cute about death and accident is there those of you who experience tragedies in life there's nothing cute about it but that is what evolutionary theory depends on death and accident over millions and millions of years now i know there are some people that are trying to compromise or make a a, a uh, you know a common theme here of okay maybe God used evolution so think about that evolution depends on death and accident for millions of years then God in the story and we'll get into this a little bit later inside when we can talk about Adam and Eve and, and some of their genome uh, but death and accident over millions of years, finally you get to what the evolutionists believe today, that there may have been a population of 10,000 fancy monkeys. Eventually all this death and accident and, and uh, copying mistakes in the DNA leads to upright walking monkeys 
And maybe there's 10,000 of them, they speculate. And maybe, if you want to believe in God anyway, and a lot of people believe this, God picked two of them. Maybe there are two really good, a man and a woman, really good, fancy monkeys, walking upright, and God chose to work with them and called them Adam and Eve. And that's how God used the evolutionary story. And then we get to Adam and Eve, and God gives them the rules to live by and his commands. And of course, he says, now if you sin against me, you shall surely die. And Adam can scratch his head and say, wait a minute. My parents are dead. My grandparents. Everywhere around me, I see death and disease. In fact, for millions of years to get here, it was death and disease. So if I sin, I'm going to die? Huh. I know I'm going to do that anyway. What's the big deal? You see, if you try to compromise these stories, you get death and disease before sin, the conscious act of rebellion against God. Theologically, that's a big problem. And we'll touch on that a little bit later in the beginning of the talk. So, I mentioned DNA. We're going to get into that. Does that give us any insight into these two questions? Let me, uh, let me try and help you picture or visualize a graph. Um, we'll, show, we'll show you this a little bit in the, in the Sunday school hour with a, uh, on screen. But think of a graph. I'm an engineer. I love graphs. You can show a lot of data, data and communicate trends and information very quickly on a graph. So you know what a graph looks like, right? Remember the y-axis is the one that goes up and down, usually on your left. And that's going to be how much information is in the DNA. How strong is that information? So going up on the graph, you've got a little bit of information, and DNA gets stronger and stronger, bigger and more complicated as you go up on the graph. Across the bottom, the x-axis, we're going to call that time, over time. OK? So according to the evolutionary story, and I think this is a good way to portray it. If you were down at your lower left, you've got low DNA information, and you've got the beginning of time and whatever time scale you want. So the first, somehow, the first living cell pops into existence, and it's only got a little bit of DNA, and that little bit of DNA, maybe 130,000 base pairs of information, which Sounds like a lot, but it's still a little piece of DNA, but that's all the cell needs. And eventually, over time, as we go across the bottom axis, the amount of DNA, basically through mutations and copying mistakes, actually increases. So you go from the lower left, think of that, on a graph, it goes up over time. And eventually, you get to that jellyfish, and that jellyfish type thing turns into a bony fish because now it's got a backbone and it's got the structure and it can walk on the land, turns into an amphibian. And to do all that, finally get to a T-Rex or a fancy monkey or people, the y-axis, you need more and more information. You got it? Anybody? Clear as can be on a day like today outside. But it's just a graph going from lower left to up, right? That's the evolutionary story, increasing DNA over time. And of course, the creation story, as I mentioned, that begins, if you look at the same graph, and you took the DNA of people at the left side, but not at the lower left, at the upper left. That's where the genome was written. That's the beginning, when God said everything was good, and every kind reproduces after its own kind. That is now in the upper left, and then sin enters the world, and it's been in decay ever since. So the graph basically goes from the upper left and goes downward over time, whatever time you want to put in it. So you got two different stories. You got that? Evolutionary story, DNA robustness, amount of information, goes from the lower left, goes upward over time, and with creation, we begin with perfect DNA, and over time, due to sin and entropy, it goes down. 
So two totally different views of how DNA would work over time. You got it? I think you do. So how does it go up? What is the, uh, the main mechanism of neo-Darwinism today? Yes, yes, I heard the word over here, mutations. Mutations are what? Copying mistakes. And they can happen for many reasons. Sometimes, and we know it happens, as you age, all the cells in your body have to be replaced. Some get replaced in a year, some get replaced over 10, 12 years. But if you're more than 20, every cell in your body has been replaced. And when that happens, of course, the DNA inside the nucleus has to be copied. And you get copies of copies over time. Plus, more importantly, as you have children, one of those pairs of the 23 volumes, the 23 chromosomes, gets matched with mama's pair. Uh, mama and daddy each contribute one half of that pair of the 23 chromosomes, those volumes, and we have conception. But even there, you have, can have copying mistakes. So a lot of reasons for these. You know, we know radiation, different chemicals can increase the rate of mutations, but mutations are all around us. And that's the mechanism. Now, Hollywood, uh, I know most of you don't go to movies, but how many of you seen the X-Men movies? Yeah, they're fun. I enjoy a good science fiction yarn, a little bit of escapism. And science fiction books and movies, they have a little bit of science, and then they try to make it plausible of, you know, different things from ray guns to deep sea creatures and stuff. The beginning of the X-Men uh, movies, they always have this quote that's read very clearly. And of course, Hollywood is in on it. Most of Hollywood anyway, it promotes evolutionary theory. You don't need God. And every actress and actor can have a divorce and get married and have affairs all they want because there is no God. And of course they want to push that idea on our children. And so in the X-Men movies, as just one example, they have this quote. Mutation, it's the key to our evolution. It has enabled us to evolve from a single-celled organism into the dominant species on the planet. The process is slow normally taking thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But every few hundred millennia, evolution leaps forward, right? Of course, that's when you get guys, you know, with spikes growing out of their fists and all the other different powers the X-Men have. So the rest of it is just fun stories, but they try to base it and teach mutations is the, is the a basic key to this story to become the dominant species and increase the amount of information. So remember, wait a minute, at its core, a mutation, even though that's a fancy word, is just a copying mistakes. And so the question is, if you're thinking about this, can mutations, copying mistakes, can they actually increase information to take us upward over time on that graph? Can they do that? After all, the simple cell may only have 130,000 base pairs, as I mentioned at the beginning of this story. But then it's got to turn into a multicellular creature and have specialization between the different cells, some are, and then eventually backbones, and all of that to structure and development to make you you. When we get to people, we have about 3 billion base pairs of information. And that, again, those are those base pairs, the nucleotides, and they're spread out over all 23 pairs of chromosomes. All of that together is about 3 billion nucleotides or base pairs of DNA. That's a lot of information. 130,000 sounds like a big number, but when you go to 3 billion, that is a whole different story. And the idea is, oh, can mutations really do that? Can they? Hey, maybe you want to do this experiment. How many of you have seen a copy machine, right? And you can take a brand new document, a one-page document. Let's take the Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson. And he writes it out. And it's got a lot of information in it and a lot of logic in it. But it's still one page. 
but it communicates information. And let's say that represents a simple cell DNA, one page. Information, King George can read it and get very angry. But it's one page. So let's take our one page document, put it on top of the copy machine, hit the button, and make a copy. Now, that's the next generation. Take that copy and let's put that on top of the copy machine and make a copy of the copy. Okay, that's the next generation of these copying. By the way, in the early days, especially, have you seen on a copying machine? It said, put the copy face down or, you know, put your original face down. How many of you seen pictures of somebody like this on a copy machine? I take it, you literally on that case. <laughs> copy face down. But we're gonna take another copy and put it on top of the machine and make a copy of the copy and a copy of the copy. And then, you know, if you make a dozen of these generations, copy of the copy of the copy of the copy of the copy, you notice that a T in the original may now look like an I. Or an M may now look like an R and an N. And you go, oh, it's changing a little bit. In fact, where I had one letter, I now have two letters. Wow, that is creating new information. Now, after 10, 12 generations, I can still read the copy. But now let's keep taking that copy and make a copy of the 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 copy. And keep doing that, copy of the copy of the copy. And eventually, you're gonna see Two pages jump out of the copy machine, not just one. Because now, all those copying mistakes have accumulated and I've got more letters and it has to fit on two pages. And I keep making copies of copies. That's what the evolutionary story is, if you think about it. I'm making copy the copy the copy the copy. Mutations come along, natural selection picks the right one, and so I've got a lot of copies and then they just keep going. But at the end of the process, maybe hundreds of generations, thousands of generations, I don't just end up, start with one page copy, like I have a page like I had before, but I end up with Thomas Jefferson's entire library. That's how you go from 130,000 base pairs to three billion base pairs of information. Can that happen? Everything we've learned about mutations, everything that's going on says that's ridiculous. And I tried to make it simple with the story of the copy machine or the copy of the copy of the copy. That's the story. I've had nobody refute that. But everybody can understand you're not going to get a thousand pages after a thousand generations out of a copy machine beginning with one page. In fact, mutations are not good. Mutations, this is a, from a me medical genetics textbook. Mutations are pathologic disease causing, but we don't apply that to evolutionary theory. The worst diseases that doctors treat today are caused by genetic mutations. In the 1990s, we were up to 4,000 diseases caused by mutations in DNA. The human genome, and this is from the Human Genome Project. You all heard about that, the mapping of the genome. They said, the human genome contains a complete set of instructions for the production of a human being. Genome research has already exposed errors or the mutations in these instructions that lead to heart disease, cancer, neurological degeneration. Wait a minute. This is supposed to be getting me more information, more complex information? No, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. And that's what the genetic research is saying. As late as the 1970s, Ernst Chan was a biochemist and a Nobel Prize winner. He said, the development and survival of the fittest is entirely a consequence of chance mutation or that nature carries out experiments by trial and error through mutations in order to create living systems better fitted to survive seems to be in hypothesis based on no evidence. If you dig into it, there never was much evidence and Darwin admitted it. He just thought that maybe we'd have it by now, but actually it's gotten worse. Neo-Darwinism 
depends on the mutations to provide new information, and all the scientific research says it doesn't. Today, we're probably well over 6,000 genetic diseases. That is not going well. The copying mistakes are causing trouble, just like if you introduce copying mistakes into one of the apps on your phone or the operating system of a large computer. You think it's going to work better? Even if there was one good one every once in a while, the sheer number of bad mutations overwhelm anything that could possibly happen from a copying mistake that's good. So what we have is a story where genetics is telling us that copying mistakes are causing us to go into decay, which is what we see all around us. In 2010, a very uh, important science magazine, a peer-reviewed science journal, Trends in Genetics, pointed out that the most studies of recent evolution involve the loss of traits. We're losing genetic information, and end quote, we still understand little of the genetic changes needed in the origin of novel or new traits, unquote. That's the real science. Dr. Sanford, a friend of mine who is a world-class geneticist, he invented the gene gun. He did genetic research for 30 years at Cornell, has almost 100 science papers and peer-reviewed journals. He didn't become a Christian until age 50. And then he realized all of his genetic research matches the biblical account of of uh, genetic information declining and not the evolutionary account where it's increasing. Today, after becoming a Christian at age 50, he's in his early 70s, I believe. I know him, and he's one of the most soft-spoken, nicest men you've met. And he said it wasn't always like that. He became a Christian. Today, he's born again, claims Jesus Christ, and he believes the Bible. He said this, the more the mutations, the less the information. This is fundamental to the mutation process. So I've got a lot more quotes here. We'll get into a little bit more during the Sunday school hour. But basically, that graph, that idea that mutations over time can increase information from genetic research, from just the idea of a copying machine, that has been falsified. That's what happens when you do science. You look at it, you do experiments, you study it. And if your theory doesn't fit the data, you need to discard it. But what's the alternative? God had created, and that graph where we begin with perfect DNA, sin enters the world, and then it's going in decline, that fits the data. As an engineer, do you want me to build things based on data? for storytelling. That fits the data. Folks, your Bible is true. Sin entered the world. Mutations are diseases. We cannot overcome them with copying mistakes. In fact, they get worse. They are getting worse. Some people, some geneticists think we'll probably go extinct in a few thousand years. Of course, Jesus will return before then. I believe. So where are you? Sin causes death, and the wages of death is sin. And all of the evidence, and we've got tons of it, be sure and check out our book table and DVDs inside, or even thumb drives with presentations by scientists. Check it all out. We're all going to die and face our Creator. Judgment. Just as is appointed for men to die once, after this comes judgment. You can take care of that sin problem. That's the whole point of the gospel. We can't overcome sin on our own. We can't make up for a sin against an almighty, perfect God, can we? And yet Jesus loved us. He died for us. So if you've never invited Jesus to take care of the sin problem, to take care of the entropy, the degeneration, invite him into your heart like Dr. Sanford did. And I did. Pastor Ed, many of you. Invite Jesus into your heart. Lord God, forgive me all my sin and help me to live the life you live because your word is true. And get into a Bible study. It's worth studying. I've been doing it 
for 50 years. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Despite our sin, you have provided a way to take care of that. We don't need to decay and continue falling apart. Yet we know in this world we will. But because of sin, that's why you are going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And you have that promise that if we just take care of our sin problem, today it's by faith in Jesus Christ, we take care of that sin problem, wow, we don't have to live in, a, in another world that's full of sin and decay and suffering. you offering us heaven. And we praise you, give honor and glory to you. And I invite everybody here to invite Jesus into their heart. Lord, we commit this time. Thank you for everybody here. Bless every one of them. Be with us in our uh, Sunday school when we look more into this. Bless this time and this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Let's stand together one more time this morning.
Amen. You may be seated just for a couple minutes. Those of you who are watching us online, we just appreciate you tuning in and uh, just want to encourage you if you made a decision for Christ or you want to give us some information how we can pray for you, make sure you go to the website, pleasantviewbett.com, pleasantviewbett.com, and you'll see a tab there that says about, and you just click on that. You'll see, take the next step, and it'll take you right to a card you can fill out, give us some information, any prayer requests, and then hit submit. and emails it right to my email and we'll be in contact with you and again thank you for watching today helmet alluded to the inside the lobby there there's a table and there's all kinds of uh, resources from the klutzy creation science association that they've accumulated and all the proceeds from that goes to that ministry and so anita will be up at the table and by check or credit card you can uh, purchase those things if you would like don't forget that at 1045, just about 15 minutes, we'll be inside in the sanctuary socially distancing. Maybe you came and you weren't necessarily thinking of staying, but you can because we'll have plenty of space in there to spread out. And uh, we welcome you to stay from 1045 to 1145. And then 1145, we'll have a very brief business meeting. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. And of course, the kids will be downstairs for Sunday school and all the connect groups in junior high and senior high will be upstairs in the sanctuary. A few few of you would be willing to help uh, the crew here clean up today. We're just gonna take everything inside and right inside the door on the left is where it's gonna go. So if a few of you'd like to stay and help us with that, that'd be great. But I know Dennis Bland and Banya, you're gonna help with the sound and the computer so you guys can uh, meet with Helmet in just a few moments to take care of prepare, preparation for that. Let's close our time in prayer and as we pray. I'm just compelled to pray for our country as I think about yesterday and the return and a call for repentance for our country, especially as we look to just less than a month now, uh, just about a month, I should say, uh, the election coming upon us and all that's going on in our country. So let's pray. Father, we're grateful that we can gather together. We thank you for the founding of our nation. And Lord, we know that it wasn't a perfect founding, but we know they attempted to build it on Judeo-Christian principles. And many of the people that were involved in the founding of our country were Christians. And I can't help but think of George Washington's farewell address where he says that this country, this republic was established for religious people. And if we take religion out of it, it's gonna be destructive. We won't be the republic that it was intended to be. So we pray, Lord, for our country. We pray for repentance. We pray that we would not depend on man and our abilities, but Lord, we would fall on our knees and admit our sin and call upon you to forgive us individually and forgive our country, Lord. We think of over 60 million babies that have been aborted, and that's just sin and, and pain in your eyes, Lord. Innocent children. Think of same-sex marriage and how these things, Lord, just go against your word. And we just pray that we would confess our sin, and we just pray that we repent, and that we know according to 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that if we do these things, you will forgive our sins and you will heal our land. And that would be our desire to bring revival across our country. So be with the elections coming up, be with all the unrest. And Lord, we just pray that through this, you would even do amazing ministry in hearts and lives of people. Continue to help us as we go through this COVID-19 pandemic as well. Keep us safe, keep us, keep us healthy and help us to be wise in uh, how we uh, take care of ourselves. Now, Lord, we just thank you for this privilege to be outside. We pray your blessing upon each one today. We thank you that it was good to gather together in the house of the Lord, whether it's inside or out. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You're dismissed.